The public hearing of the qualified voters of the Southampton Union Free School District, Town of Southampton, Suffolk County, New York, is being held via live stream at the Southampton School District Information Facebook page. Okay, sorry, the dates are on yet. Will be held live in person at the music room in the Southampton Intermediate School and, in call, and is called in order at 6.37 p.m. for the transaction of business as authorized by the education law, including the following items. Number one, to present to voters a detailed statement of the amount of money which will be required for the 2023-2024 fiscal year. Number two, to discuss all items here and after set forth to be voted upon by voting machine at the budget vote and election to be held on Tuesday, May 16th, 2023. And number three, to transact such other business as may properly come before the meeting pursuant to education law of the state of New York and acts amendatory thereto. The first budget that I'm going to ask to be presented is Ms. Brenda Simmons for the Southampton, Southampton African American Museum. Ms. Simmons. Good evening, my name is Brenda Simmons. I am the founder and executive director of the Southampton African American Museum. As you can see the vision, you told me I should have done this, but I don't feel like it, so I'll let them do it. <laughs> the vision for the Southampton African American Museum was back in March 2008. After a challenging learning experience, the museum was awarded a nonprofit status from the New York State. Next. Sam's mission statement to promote an understanding and appreciation of the African American culture by creating programs that will preserve the past, encourage learning, and enhance the life of the community. Sam will research and collect local history produce media events, create exhibit, exhibits, and community celebrations for all to come. Sam will research and collect everything that is important to not just the Black community, but our community as, as a whole. Sam will treasure the past, tend to the present, and transform the future. Next. Southampton African American Museum, is the first African-American site to be historically designated in the village of Southampton, and is the first black barbershop to be transformed to a museum in the country. Next. For 10 years, uh, the African-American Museum sponsored uh, film, black, film festival, black film festivals and spoken word live jazz with many high school students and also local community members coming there to recite their poems for the first time, as well as purposely giving space and opportunity for new local artists. Next. That's the picture of the official grand opening of 2020 Juneteenth weekend. And after a labor of love for over 16 years, words cannot express how I felt that evening or that afternoon, surrounded by friends and families and genuine supporters of the cause. Next. There you will see a few items. During the renovation of the transformation of the barbershop, so many items were found on the ground. There was also, those of you who don't know, there was also a juke joint next to the barbershop years ago that was built by Mr. Arthur Fudge Robinson. And the two first items you see were found in the vicinity of the juke joint. An unopened Christian Brothers wine bottle. And that green bottle you see 
When I did the research, I find out there was a liquid they used for municipal purposes back in far as 1936, believe it or not. The third item, very interesting, they were digging and they hit a, a, a well, a hit, a hit something and it had a flood and they couldn't find um, the actual meter. When they called Suffolk County, they couldn't find it because it was so old. And then when they finally discovered, they said it was one of the first water meters that was installed in the village. The last item you see there, um, there was, they found on a tree in the, in the, on the premises that was rotten and needed to be removed. And when they removed it, what they found was an attachment that appears to be an attachment to a horse and buggy. And a dear friend of ours from the community who knows a lot about the Hillcrest community information said there was a gentleman on the hill years ago who owned a horse. So we're pretty sure that that's where that came from. The official renovation had very much a lot of challenges, stops and starts, beginning in October 2018. And then again in October 2019, in the midst of the construction restrictions due to COVID. But again, after 16 years, the grand opening was Juneteenth, 2021. And I want to add, CMX Sammy, I don't know if anybody knows him, he was our architect and a dear friend of mine who really stuck with me through this whole, almost this whole 16 year project. And he really designed this building with special cultural sensitivity, thought and care. And the grand opening was such a, an awesome time and he came over to me and he said to me, he says, Brenda, this is, this is the day this had to happen. It was the weekend that Juneteenth was officially uh, officially uh, made um, an official, I get it out, an official holiday, and also the restrictions were lifted as well. So everybody's ready to party, needless to say. <laughs> Next. With the gracious support and the kindness and the blessings of my friend Peter Marino, our first exhibition consisted of Peter's special choices of art from his private collection. Stanford Biggers, Carol Walker, Melvin Edwards, Glenn Liggins, and a phenomenal piece by Theaster Gates. Next. Sharing American history is exciting and essential. Our keynote speaker for the first year was Professor Quincy Mills. He's an associate professor of the history at the University of Maryland College Park. He wrote a book, he's a gentleman up in the corner in the top with the glasses. He wrote a book called Cutting Along Colored Lines, Black Barbers and Barbershops in America. And you see uh, Assemblyman Fred Thiel there. We had so many state officials, county officials, village officials, all representing. It was a whole connected community that came to support and to celebrate. And last year, our keynote speakers, the woman there next to the gentleman with the glasses, was Alila Bundles. And Alila Bundles is the great great granddaughter of one of the first black millionaires in the 1900s, an entrepreneur of hair and beauty product products, and a nonsense activist. Her name was Madam C.J. Walker. First, I want to identify this mural. This mural was made by David Martin from the reservation. It's such a very, very special, special um, mural, mural that he made for me, specifically for the museum, and it depicts the Great Migration, the history of the barbershop and the beauty parlor, the juke joint, and the gentleman in the whale there, Pierce Concert. Last year, we received a $125,000 grant from the Robert David Lyon Gardner Foundation to create and install the state of an art augmented virtual reality digital tapestry application. And it's such an amazing, we had so many local church groups and even they had two uh, bike tours that made their stops purposely to the museum to do a tour. And we've done things like we've done a lot of, we do ex exhibitions every year, two exhibitions a year. And we did a film this past year called The Inventor. And it was the, a short film about the story of the, uh, Garrett Moritz, Garrett Morgan, the inventor of the gas masks as well. And we've done a lot of collaborations with the Southampton Arts Center and also the Southampton History uh, Museum. So we've done a lot of things um, and a lot of collaborations over the summer that was very, very busy. I'll say that, but it was very, very rewarding. Next. For 10 years, the museum collaborated with the Southampton Elementary School's fourth grade classes 
with, its, with included a yearly school trip during Black History Month with an art exhibition produced by the students followed by Meet the Mayor and Black History Program in the Village Boardroom. And it was just an amazing um, event where, I can't tell you, it was one of my highlights when I was supposed to be assistant to the mayor, but that was one of my highlights. They actually would come to the board, to the um, Village Hall, and we set up a um, exhibition. They would do history about, you know, black history about maybe inventors, et cetera, and we'd do an exhibition in the, in the vestibule. They would come down to the mayor's office, to the boardroom, and they'd do this whole program. It was just very, very nice. And the other picture you see was a, was a Girl Scout group that came um, to um, experience the digital tapestry app. Next. Sam is now a part of the Econic Teacher Center, a professional development consortium of 14 Eastern school districts, specifically the community badging program, which provides opportunity for teachers to earn in-service credit while learning about community resources. It was such a pleasure assisting the Conic Teachers Center to develop a program, and they are actually utilizing part of our digital tapestry program that we have after we have it at Sam. How will we utilize the funding next? We're looking to uh, increase the administrative capacity for the mu museum that would enable us to bring more program and activities to our local schools and our community. We're looking to hire a program manager or an executive director. We'd like to catalog those, art those articles that we found. We'd like to catalog those things. We have a lot more in storage too, but I, I'm not gonna bore you to, um, to mention all those. We have a wonderful, um, juke joint picture that was donated from the South End Historical Museum. I should have had a picture of that. And then also we definitely need um, to get more digital tapestry headphones when people come to do the digital tapestry experience. So thank you. Any questions? I'm um, here, here and we can you can go to our website www.saamuseum.org and book a tour. If you want to do group tours you can call 631 353-3299. And come and please enjoy the digital tapestry. And on Tuesday, May 16th, vote for proposition number eight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next to present the, the proposed budget for the Southampton History Museum, we have Tom Edmonds. I'm going to stand over here because I can't see. My narrative is on the uh, slide. Tom, the problem is people watching it via live stream won't hear you unless you're near the microphone. I will go bring the mic. Yeah, I practiced a little before I started. What's that? So let's see if I can do this. Is that too loud? Okay. Uh, thanks for the introduction. My name is Tom Edmonds. I'm the director of the Southampton History Museum, and we are proposition number nine. The Southampton History Museum is requesting $275,000 for the next school year. This is a 3.7 percentage increase from last year's request. It will be 42% of our annual budget of $650,000. I'd like to show you some photographs of our activities. This is our main property in the village of Southampton. It's the Rogers Mansion Muse Museum Complex. What's new? First, the bad news. The mansion is rapidly deteriorating. Last year, New York State and the village of Southampton awarded the museum $1.2 million to restore the Rogers Mansion's windows, roof, chimneys, and facade at no cost to the residents of the Southampton School District. Uh, the good news, a new education courtyard was installed this year. The $500,000 project was paid for with funds from the Southampton Village and museum donors. We are hoping and planning on sharing this new space at no charge for, to the uh, Southampton Youth Association, uh, SAM, um, and Heart of the Hampton so that they can have their own fundraisers. So we were blessed with getting this beautiful courtyard and we want to share it. The brick walkway currently stops at the paint shop, but will continue to all the buildings on the complex. 
The goal is to make our entire campus ADA compliant. The Research Center is vital for creating our education programs, exhibits, blogs, and lectures. It is also a, sort, a source for amazing discoveries, which I'm hoping not to bore you with here, but this happened two weeks ago. Uh, a gentleman came to us and he invited us to tour his house, which uh, that's Lake Agawaman in the background. He said that in 1960, he created his house out of two historic schoolhouses that used to be on Main Street. We quickly made an appointment to see them. Uh, on the tour, we found a vertical panel door with a, thumb, with a thumb latch commonly used in historic buildings about 200 years ago. That was quite a surprise with what you walk into thinking it's a 1960s house. Uh, we went back to our archive in our research center and found a document that said a schoolhouse in 1804 was built at Main and Nugent Streets. In 1814, a section was removed from that one schoolhouse to create another one on Job's Lane. In 1860, both were sold and moved to a private property. So those are, those are sketches uh, uh, made by somebody. Um, and there was the connection. The door in the drawing room matched the 1804 door found inside the house. Wow. So that was what was once known as the smallest house on Lake Agawam is now considered one of the oldest houses in the neighborhood. Who would know from looking at it? When COVID began, we concentrated on going electronic. Our YouTube channel now has nearly 2,000 subscribers with over 275,000 attendees to 81 Zoom lectures. Visitors attend the digitally preserved programs uh, every single day. During the past year, we hosted Zoom le uh, lectures on the natural history of Long Island with Professor uh, Tara Ryder, a poetry reading by Scott Chasky, uh, the history of the Shinnecock tribe with Jeremy Dennis, and a poetry workshop with Carol Stone. In-person programs were slowly reintroduced last year. A professional blacksmith now gives lessons in our blacksmith shop. Our thrift shop reopened. It is now the only one in the village and attracts shoppers from around the region to Southampton's business district, which uh, I consider us an important member of. Last year, we installed an exhibit called Puppies, Ponies, and Pussycats, Tales of Southampton. We thought it would be fun to pair historic images of people's pets with those uh, today. Uh, a few local artists were shown uh, in the exhibit, including these by Diana Maxwell Smith, who's an important member artist in our village. Uh, in March, just uh, two months ago, we opened Gilded Icons, Forgotten Treasures from the Sam Parrish Collection. Uh, the artwork was formerly on exhibit at the original Parrish Art Museum on Joe Plain. These uh, 30, these 17 paintings have not been seen have not been seen in 70 years. Hiking tours, co-hosted with the Southampton Trails Preservation Society, began as a cope safe activity. Am I doing something funny? Uh, they continue to be very popular with free admission. T a senior teas, co-sponsored by the Southampton Village Senior Committee, continue throughout the year also with free admission. We share our campus with many nearby nonprofits. The Southampton Youth Association organizes education programs and special events for us at the Rogers Mansion. Thank you very much. Uh, during the summer, we lead uh, lessons in traditional handcrafts uh, for the Methodist Church Summer Camp. Here are our kids learning how to shape a quill pen and use handmade ink. Thank you, Julian. Visitors from assisted living facilities in the region come for tours. As you can see here, the future brick walkway will be much appreciated. Our annual antique fire truck show is held on Labor Day weekend. No admission is ever charged to showcase our Southampton Volunteer Fire Department. Our annual Haunted Village tours take place every weekend in October. They are offered with free admission and enjoyed by hundreds of young families, and they are very, very 
Our second property, Halsey House and Garden, is a certified monarch butterfly way station. That's a national organization that makes sure that you use organic landscaping supplies. An organic herb garden behind Halsey House exhibits plants used during colonial times for cooking, healing, and plants for dyeing homespun cloth like indigo. Unfortunately for Halsey House, which is New York State's oldest wood frame building, there are terrible foundation problems. It is now unsafe for public tours inside and will be closed for this year. But the exterior is a perfect place to showcase artwork and a variety of outdoor programs have been created. A grant from New York State Council on the Arts has enabled us to mount a mural curated by Harlem Needle Arts depicting the history of indigo dye. The mural depicts women of power in the West African cultural region of Yoruba, into, uh, who for centuries developed and sold indigo to an international market, which they still do today. Indigo was an important element of colonial era trade routes. Uh, it was so valued that the dyed indigo was often used for money. Workshops and textile dyeing using indigo will be offered by the murals artist at Halsey House this summer. In addition, eco workshops at Halsey House on the grounds will include lessons on outdoor painting, beekeeping, herb gardening, and uh, the monarch butterflies. Our third property, the Pelletier Silver Shop, is uh, managed by jewel jeweler Alyssa Sasante. She keeps the museum open five days a week. Her workshops and jewelry making are very popular and offered year-round. A colonial-style vegetable garden is maintained in the back of the shop for visitors who want to pick it yourself. Hardworking volunteers keep the shop's garden and grounds looking great. The museum's fourth property is the Conscience Point. Uh, we, one day it will be part of a larger public attraction to be known as the North Sea Maritime Center. Museum volunteers are working with the town of Southampton to create a unified plan with a playground and an activity center with workshops on carpentry. This is uh, Shinnecock historian Shanae Bullock, who uh, leads the Indigenous Perspective Canoe Tours in North Sea Harbor. She has a beautiful voice and she sings in native languages. It's stunning. That's, I think she's singing right at this moment. Uh, we also partner with the East End Explorers who offer Paddle Happy Summer Camp. Isn't that a great title? Paddle Happy for children. Conscience Point Shellfish Hatchery's aquaculture program continues to supply over one million oyster seeds to the North Sea Harbor and other bays. This was astonishing when I learned this, but one single oyster can clean 50 gallons of polluted water a day. I hope this has given you an understanding of the breadth of our progress and pro preservation efforts. We listen carefully to the people in our community and do our best to respond with value in so many ways. I hope everyone will approve our proposed budget request along with those of the Southampton African Museum, the Perry Sharp Museum, and the Southampton Youth Association. Your vote in favor ensures the well-being of our much-loved community. Thank you. Next to present the Parish Art Museum proposed budget is Ms. Martha Slotsky. Slots, Stals, Slotsky. I'm gonna let you. I'm gonna let you. <laughs> Screw on that, right? Yeah, yeah. I should be able to pronounce that too. It's Slotsky. Very good. You're not alone. Hi, everybody. Thank you very much for this inviting me to talk about the Parish Art Museum. Um, I'm the new deputy director of arts education. Though it, this is my second time in the parish, I actually worked there in the early 90s, and I'm very glad to be back. My predecessor is sitting up there. Are you putting? Perfect. Okay. So each year, um, the tax levy from the Southampton School District 
funds free admission to the museum and many of its programs for all of you, all residents and employees of the Southampton School District. We also offer free admission to SNAP recipients, veterans, and active military. Um, you also get free or discounted admission to, to workshops and classes, and children in Southampton get first right of refusal for all of our free after-school programs. Um, and also invitations to all sorts of special receptions throughout the year. And as you know, we are an art, an art museum. We have a collection of more than 3,000 works of art, and we present exhibitions that rotate uh, all throughout the year. And this is this year's uh, exhibition schedule, which is, I think, a particularly good, a good season. The show that just opened this week is called Artists Choose Parish, and it is 41, it's going to actually continue in, in various parts throughout the whole year, and there are 41 artists, American artists, many of whom live out here, who have selected works of art from the parish's collection, things that hadn't been, haven't really been seen in many, many, many years, and they are exhibiting sort of in dialogue with these works of art, so it's a really exciting show. Uh, and then this summer, we're going to have an exhibition of the abstract expressionist painter James Brooks, who is not, you may not know his name, though you know the names of de Kooning and Pollock, but Brooks was a really important painter, and so this is, a, I think, the first retrospective in a very long time of his work. Uh, then we'll have a collection show of many of you know, the collection, the, the parish's collection of East End artists, and then everybody's favorite show, the student exhibition. I hope you guys got to come see that this year. It was particularly amazing. I'll show you, in a, in a minute, I'll put up an amazing work of art from there. And then the next, the show that we're doing next uh, next spring, I'm particularly excited about. It's part of the parish's new commitment to doing a show that relates to social justice issues every year. And so this is going to be a, a show on food it's a fun, it's, it's a humorous show in certain ways, but the programming that's going to be built around that is going to take on some of the biggest issues that we face in this country, in this world, issues around food, uh, food justice, the, the history as well as the future of agriculture and how we're going to feed all the people on this planet, um, and also uh, sort of the local uh, need, needs for food. We saw during COVID how the food pantries were truly struggling. Um, and that had that need remains in our community. So those, so we're going to have this very beautiful exhibition, but build a lot of very relevant programming around it. Oh, too fast. And these are just these are two shots from this year's student exhibition. The piece on the left was made by the Hayground School, and it is a turtle, a sea turtle made out of trash that the students collected. From our beaches and it was astounding was seeing people's I mean it was something that if you saw in the Whitney Museum of American Art you would not you would think it was you know a grown-up professional artist it was really profound and then on the right we had again the awards presentation for the high school uh, student artists which was really remarkable this year we also produce hundreds of tours concerts talks and films during the year um, on the upper left is uh, an artist who, from El Salvador who, whose work was up during the student exhibition actually this year, and he was here with us for a week, and he worked with 250 community members, both children and adults, um, talking about his life as an immigrant from El Salvador and how, and how his work represents that, um, his, his journey coming to America and becoming a professional artist. So we work with lots of community groups, um, including uh, uh, the East Hampton uh, affordable housing community. We worked with an organization, a new partnership uh, with a group called the, Mi the Rural and Migrant Ministry out of Riverhead, which is a service organization for uh, farm and vineyard workers. So that was, it was an amazing program. And then our salon series of concerts which are classical concerts are Friday evenings, and they're starting again, actually, this Friday. In the summer, there's a, a jazz series with Hampton's Jazz Fest that takes place out on the terrace. So I'm 
particularly proud of the education program. Obviously, that's my job um, at the museum. And Kara, I will say, has done an amazing job in the last 29 years or so building up. So I had a lot to walk into. So thank you. Um, we do more than 100 family programs, workshops for kids, um, and a summer camp. We've, uh, for many, many years, done an after-school art program, which is a free program, and priority goes to children of Southampton School District residents. And that program is twice a week. It's amazing. We just started a new middle school after-school club uh, called Middle School Makers. And we are, have been doing a, a free teen program in the high school, but we just started a new program. We launched our program on Friday, a teen art crawl. So if you have any teenagers, bring them our way. We took uh, eight or nine kids to a gallery tour in, East Ham, uh, in Southampton and Starbucks and pizza, and they were all very happy. And so we're hoping they're going to be the future, future, they're the future audience of the museum. So we're bringing them on. Um, we also give every year at more than 50 school and group tours, lots of collaboration with uh, community, uh, community partners, and about 50 or so, or 150, I can't read from here, docent-led public tours, which are also free on the weekends. So we collaborate um, with, with schools all over the, the area, really from Montauk to Santa Ridges, in terms of uh, hosting tours, art workshops, in-school programs, um, of course, the student exhibition. And there's also an artist in residence program that brings one artist to work with about 300 kids in a very short time, like four to six weeks, and to produce a communal work of art, collaborative work of art exhibited in the exhibition. Um, this year, it was an artist named Darlene Charneco, and the piece was really, truly Beautiful, beautiful. Um, we work with particularly Southampton school children from pre-K through high school. We're hoping to start again for many years. We had a program in the middle school where uh, Wendy Golly, who's in the back of the room, was in the, in the actual school classrooms um, weekly, and COVID sort of put an end to that, but we're ready to gear, to gear back up for that. And again, very you know, long-term partnerships. I, I in the '90s when I was here, we had a wonderful partnership. Karen and I worked with uh, the, your amazing high school faculty, who are no longer you know, have retired, um, to to curate exhibitions with students, and that work continues in various ways. Uh, Wendy has a monthly uh, pre-K program. Okay, so the other work that we do aside from schools is we do something called Access Parish, which works with um, people who may not have easy access to museums. And so we work with the Alzheimer's Disease Research Center, uh, Stony Brook Southampton's Parkinson's uh, Center. We've just started a new collaboration with Stony Brook Southampton's Cancer Wellness Center, so we'll be providing monthly programs for cancer patients, survivors, and caregivers. Um, and uh, life skills classes, Hampton Bays, Southampton, I forget, and East Hampton as well. So these are the stats, about 60,000 people a year, just over 2,000 members, and again, free admission always for students and children, but as well as for uh, residents of Southampton School District. So we are asking this year for, I can't read it from here, just let me get my notes, $429,028, and it is Proposition 10 on the uh, annual election. So we hope you'll come visit us, and we hope you'll vote yes. Thank you. And to present the Southampton Youth Association proposed 2023-24 budget, Ms. Andrea Nardi.
Good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Andrea Nardi, as you stated. I'm the executive director of the Southampton Youth Association. Um, I'll give a little bit about uh, the history of SYA and what we accomplished this year and then what we're planning um, for next year. So first, I think SYA as an organization really speaks to the power and agency of Southampton High School students. We were started in 1969 by Southampton High School students. Um, it speaks to their level of activism and agency. It was in direct response to a need in the community, um, to an increase in drugs in the community, and kids saying, we need a space to be kids. Um, although SYA, most of our programming is for intermediate school and below, we still employ high school students. We're often their first employment experience and provide volunteer opportunities throughout the year. Our mission is to enrich, expose, expand, and encourage students. Um, and that's what we aim to do in all of the programming that we offer throughout the year. So this is a year in review. This past year, we've offered 15 recreation programs and two events. Um, some of these programs range from um, soccer clinics to flag football. We did a flag football clinic that we started last year, and we did a flag football league. Um, also, that they were able to be competitive, and we're planning that for next year as well. Um, we did an intro to hip hop and dance clinic, mainly because parents have been asking for dance. So we host an array of programs um, that are artistic, that are um, athletic, um, but just really that speak to um, how old kids and parents want to be engaged out of school time throughout the year. Some of the highlights are, I'll say our pre-K and our parent and me programming. We just started this about two years ago, um, and the pre-K programming, especially allowing pre-K campers, uh, the parents say that they love that the children get familiarity with the building in the school before the first day of school. It really helps some of them with the transition. Camp is not a full day, so it doesn't, it's not a replica of what school is like, but they get an idea of what it feels like to be in that big building. Um, they get familiar with the playground, and parents really, really enjoy having that in the summer. We stick with the same cutoff that the school has in terms of age. And so the campers are very young, but they come for a really great experience from 8 to 12 in the summer. Uh, this past summer, we had 27 pre-K students. Um, we've also begun parent and me programming that we started during COVID. And this year for our soccer clinic, we have about 85 kids in spring soccer. There are 30 children aged 18 months to two years old who show up on soccer to the field at the elementary school with their parents. And it's beautiful because they get to experience the school, the grounds, the parents are excited about coming to Southampton, um, and they really just get to start engaging with their children at a very young age. So there is a need and a want for that in the community, and we plan to expand that programming as well. We were also excited to bring gymnastics back. Um, when COVID began, we had to stop this program. It was very, very difficult to maintain safety with a program like this. And so this was the first year we were able to offer it again. It was at Southampton Intermediate School. We also did a parent and me for this. So this program ran from ages 18 months to 10 years old. We ran it for five weeks, this program. Parents want more. <laughs> and so hopefully next year we'll be able to get back to the eight to 10 week program that we were doing in the past. The events are a highlight for us. They're new for SYA. We run both of our events at the Southampton History Museum for free. Um, they allow us to use those grounds. So this is the second year we've run Egg Mania. We have a bunny there. We do lots of crafts. There's an egg hunt. Um, and then the trick-or-treat event was the first time this year. We ran this event immediately after school. So Southampton Elementary School parents would pick up and a lot of them walk over to the museum for the trick-or-treat event. This was a free event. Many families also went into the museum who maybe hadn't gone in as a family before and saw some really cool, a really cool exhibit that they had on display um, that was relevant to Halloween as well. And then as he said before, they also do the spook walk and all that. So it's just a really nice collaboration. Um, and we had a lot of high school kids come out, dress up and work for this event as well. A lot of parents are also still not comfortable going to people's homes yet. And so this was an opportunity for families and young families to trick or treat um, before it got dark and in a really safe way. And we gave out toys, we did not give out just candy. So we've been focused also on the quality of programming. And um, we've done this by hiring certified educators and coaches to lead programs and also contracting organizations. 
um, who sometimes run programs that are not at affordable cost, but when they partner with us, with us, we're able to offer the program. So Soccer Shots, for example, runs our soccer clinic. Um, we were able to offer a paddling experience to our older campers this summer with Easton Paddlers. They run a summer camp um, and we're really excited about partnering with local organizations. And it was a really, really great experience in the first time some of our kids were out on canoes. So throughout the year, we've had 450 unique registrants over throughout because we're still um, registering for track. So throughout the year, it's about 330 families and 90% of these folks are local residents. That other 10% is made up many times by folks who work in Southampton and bring their children here. And so they participate in our programs because they want to be close to their children during camp and summer. We have a Reverend Marvin Dozier Character and Community Scholarship um, that we began in 2019. Last year, the recipients were Dylan White, Tally Beaker, and Ryan Smith. We will be giving out um, a scholarship award again this year. Last year, we were able to give $1,500 to each year. We will, these were our goals from last year. We wanted to continue our vacation camps, which we've done this year. Um, they are, are running really well. It's about 25 to 27 kids. We have a lot of repeats in the vacation camps as well. Um, we've been able to hold them here at Southampton Elementary School. They do art with the art nanny. They have music and movement. Uh, they do outdoor recreation. And for families who are not traveling or working, it's a great additional activity um, for those kids. So we were able to do that. We resumed some programming that occurred after school. We did some dance pro pro programming after school, and right now have a very small program at Tuckahoe that occurs after school as well. And then we also launched a new site um, for signups. We've gone electronic, and it's um, it's been really able to like it's enabled us to pull data, which has been really really cool. Like that family data. Um, the number of students, kids who are enrolled over time. So the system has worked really well, and we think parents appreciate having the opportunity to enroll ahead of time as well. Next year, we really want to get to a place where we can sustain after-school programming at Southampton and Tuckahoe. The biggest hurdle with this has been staffing. <laughs> it's hard to hire for this type of programming, and so I'm saying it here in case people are interested. Um, parents really, really do want to have program at the school. Um, consistently every day for their kids. And so that's really our goal is to get to a place where we can do this and we can afford it and keep it at an affordable cost for families as well. Right now, we're charging about $120 a month at Tuckahoe for those families. And all of our other programs range from about $80 per program. And so that seems to be affordable for most parents. And if it's not, then we do our best to offer scholarships. We partner with these organizations, as I mentioned before, the Southampton History Museum has just been a really great partner for us on programming or allowing us to use space. Um, they have beautiful grounds. We use grounds at the Halsey House as well. Um, Southampton School District, obviously, we run most of our programs here, collaborate with staff, families here. And so we're really appreciative of all the support that we get from these organizations. And we have some plans already with the parish for next year. Um, and some parent and me programs planned um, with the parish for next year. That's exciting too. We're also part of the Easton Fund for Kids. I know some of you have seen the Cinderella bags. Um, we've do, done some fundraising with the Easton Fund for Kids. We got together with um, other nonprofits during COVID to raise funds to ensure that families who are really struggling were still able to participate in these types of activities to engage their kids outside of school um, and to be able to afford it. And so. With those funds, we were able to offer 10 summer camp scholarships last year. Um, the paddling experience that we offered for those campers, um, some of the funds went to that. We also, um, it helped support our high school scholarship and then scholarships for all of our clinics. So we never want a family to come and be like, I can't participate in soccer because I don't have it. So we are always gonna do everything that we can to make sure all of the kids, the local students here can participate in all of our programs. Our proposal for this year is $445,000. Um, that is 4% higher than what we proposed last year. 30% of our budget goes to general and administrative. So insurance, administrative co costs, softwares that we purchased to run the program, marketing, um, and then about 7% of it goes to programs. 
all of the materials, supplies, um, shirts, equipment, um, and staffing for all of the programs that we run throughout the year. We are greatly appreciated of, appreciative of all of the support of the folks in this room in particular and all of the families in the community. We are always open to feedback. We are your organization. So programs that you want, things that you want to see happening for your children, the door is always open um, and we hope to have your support. We are proposition number 11 and thank you for the opportunity to present. And to present the school budget, I'm calling up uh, Mr. Gene Mendel. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Um, the proceeding were very, um, were excellent presentations and very tough acts to follow. Um, my presentation will be brief. Uh, this is the fourth presentation under the 2023-2024 budget. Uh, first and foremost, I'd like to uh, say congratulations to the class of 2023. I know it's a bit early, but uh, I know this is a very exciting time of the year for the graduating seniors. Congratulations. Um, so, with this presentation, what I'd like to do is to uh, try to anticipate the um, questions that a voter may have at this point. Uh, so, what's the dollar amount of the proposed budget uh, for next year? Um, the total budget is $76,899,000. Um, the dollar amount for this current year is $74,990,000. So the budget increase uh, for next year will be about $1.9 million uh, year over year. And that's a percentage increase of about 2.55% year to year for the overall budget. Uh, the largest component of the budget is the tax levy. So the dollar amount of the proposed um, tax levy for next year, that's 62252000 $136, and that's up from the amount of $60,317,249 for this current school year tax levy. And the year-to-year -year increase from this current year to the proposed next year is $1,934,887. That translated into a percentage year-over-year -year increase of 3.5%. As a general reminder, this is the uh, budget that you're going to be voting on, uh, the tax levy portion. Um, there's always the possibility of that amount being reduced. Um, at the end of the year, we usually, once the, um, once the numbers are audited and uh, we determine that there is a remaining fund balance, um, I usually sit down with the Audit and Finance Committee and Dr. Dr. Dino, and depending on the amount that we have remaining from this current year, we determine if some of the funds will be appropriated to further reduce the tax levy. So there is always the possibility that this amount that is being proposed or that is being voted on could be reduced uh, before the final numbers are submitted to the town as the tax levy. So what was the maximum dollar amount for the 2023-24 tax levy allowed under the state tax cap? Um, the maximum allowable amount was $62,502,136. We went under that amount. We uh, actually decided to leave $250,000. Uh, that's why the amount, the tax levy amount is less than on um, the 62.5 million. And what's the um, possible maximum increase um, next year? The maximum increase in dollar values would have been $2,184,887 or 
Again, we went under that amount by $250,000. In terms of the uh, taxpayers, uh, what is the school tax bill of a house assessed at $2 million under the next year's school budget? Um, the average school portion of the tax levy will be about $4,203 on, on a house assessed at $2 million. Again, the amount is subject to change because if we decide that we have fund balance and we appropriate that fund balance to the final tax levy, that amount may be less. Um, the amount for this year on a house assessed at $2 million was $4,094. And what is the um, percentage increase or dollar amount of school taxes to be paid on an average? Well, actually, it shouldn't be average. On a $2 million, on a house assessed at $2 million, the proposed tax increase is 2.67% or $109.40. Again, it's subject to change based on the final fund balance. So uh, in terms of what you're being asked to vote on is the school budget as proposition number one to adopt the annual budget for next year at $76,899,000. Uh, we have proposition number two, which is uh, to elect two board members for next year. Um, two board, current board members have expiring terms at the end of the school year. So uh, I believe we have three candidates for the two seats that are expiring this year. Proposition number three is uh, from the uh, bus, bus fleet replacement capital reserve. We're asking for $130,000 to purchase a large bus, a, a 66 passenger bus um, under the capital reserve that was set up for that purpose. Again, anything that's coming out of the capital reserve will not have any impact on next year's taxes. These are funds that were set aside based on the fund balance that remain after each year. And those funds um, can be used for the specific purpose they were set up for, but will have no impact on current um, tax levy. Proposition number four is from uh, Last year, we set up a capital reserve for technology equipment. Um, the initial amount allocated to that uh, reserve was 500000 So we're requesting for $300,000 of that amount um, to purchase or replace smart panels and LCD panels for instruction, instructional spaces and workstations um, for some of our school buildings. Proposition number five is the capital reserve, uh, the 2027 capital reserve. We're requesting about $3.9 million for several projects. One is the phase two renovation to provide climate control to the first floor and offices at the Southampton Intermediate School, this building. Um, the second item is the renovation uh, to provide um, climate control to the first floor classrooms in the art wing of the high school. Uh, third item is to install a sawdust collection system in the carpentry classroom at the Southampton High School. And the fourth item is to replace the current um, scoreboard um, located at the Southampton high, high School track. It's a new video scoreboard. Proposition number six, uh, if you recall, uh, we recently purchased uh, the building across the street for the new district office. Um, so this proposition is to request an allocation of um, funds so that the um, renovations can be done to the building um, so that the district office staff and um, can move to the new um, district office located at 300 and 310 Hampton Road. Um, again, none of these propositions will have an impact on next year's taxes. And uh, seventh and final proposition from the school district side is to, um, to renew the lease on the current district office uh, space at 425 Country Road, um, County Road 39. 
and uh, the amount being requested is uh, 251,178 for the 2024 uh, year and um, six months lease on in 2025 for 129,356.70. Hopefully by that time, um, the new building will be ready for us to move um, into. And now I'll be happy to take any questions. Um, board members of the public. I know you've been hearing these numbers for a couple of months now, so. <laughs> any members of, of the public have any questions? Well, I want to thank everybody who collaborated on the budget and hopefully in two weeks we'll have a positive outcome for the budget. Thank you. There's a chance now for the public to comment on anything on any of the budget presentations you just heard. Would anyone like to come up to the podium and ask any questions regarding the public, um, the budget presentations? If not, then I'll call for an adjournment of the public hearing. This public hearing is hereby adjourned at 7.33 p.m. All right, we convene this meeting at 7.35 p.m. The board is returning to public session after having held an executive session with a proposed sale of real property and collective negotiations pursuant to Article 14 of the Civil Service Law were discussed. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. To the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, may I invite your attention for a brief announcement. Upon activation of the fire alarm, immediate evacuation to the closed emergency exit is required. The emergency exits and assembly areas are located on either side of the room. Please exit away from the building so as to not interfere with the fire department and proceed to the evacuation areas. Please follow the directions of all school officials and once assembled outside the building, everyone must wait for an all clear is given by a school official before re entering the building. Will the clerk please call the roll? Kara Compton Mayfield. Here. Anastasia Gabalas. Here. Donald J. King. Here. James F. McKenna is absent. Jacqueline Robinson. Here. Sunhi Sherwood Dudley. Here. And Jermaine Elson. Here. Does the clerk have any additional to deletions to the agenda? Yes. Uh, consent agenda item 12.20 and personnel item 14.01A have been added to the agenda. Board of Education will hold a work session meeting on Tuesday, May 16th at 6.30 p.m. in the SIS Library. The 2023 budget vote and Board of Education election will be held on Tuesday, May 16th in the SIS Music Room. Polling hours are from 10 a.m. to 9 p.m. Absentee ballots are available. Please contact the district clerk or visit our website for more information. A Meet the Candidates Night will be held on Tuesday, May 9th at 6 p.m. in the SIS Library and will be moderated by the League of Women Voters. Voter registration will be held on Wednesday, May 3rd between 1 and 5 p.m. in the District Clerk's Office. The Intermediate School Spring Concert will be held on Thursday, May 4th at 7 p.m. in the South Hampton High School Auditorium. And the Elementary School will present Willy Wonka on Friday, May 12th at 6 p.m. in the South Hampton High School Auditorium. Admission is free of charge. Several program presentations this evening. Great, thank you, President. Um, also, before we start the program presentations, there's one other um, in, um, event that's happening at the intermediate school that I asked Mr. Kobus to speak about. Thank you, Dr. Now, so just Monday the 8th is a, uh, our final parent presentation from Frank Cross, who's been coming in. This will be his fourth visit to the intermediate school. He'll be working with our fifth grade students and faculty, and then working with our entire faculty at our faculty meeting, and, and once again, presenting to parents in the intermediate school library. Um, the topic of his final visit is going to be the use of social media 
as it relates to brain development and adolescence. So I know I have a fifth grader at home, just got an Apple Watch. So how those interactions on social media and with devices impact uh, your student. If you're interested in that, please uh, feel free to come 7 o'clock in the Intermediate School Library. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you, Mr. Kildas. We have three exciting programs for you to hear tonight. Um, the first program I wanted to introduce is, um, I want to give you a little bit of background. As you know, Lord, we are a dual language school district, um, and the dual language program evolves from dual language at the elementary school to the ESA program at the intermediate and the high schools. Part of our relationship with the Ministry of Spain is that we're given the opportunity to have a language and culture assistant um, provided um, to us by the Ministry of Spain. And the individual comes to us each year. It's a different individual each, each year that's chosen to complement our programs. And the person works with our dual language and ESA classes to provide culture and language assistance for our students. Well, I had the opportunity to hear our 2023 cultural language assistant speak at the um, World Language Honor Society. And he really gave a moving um, talk on the impact of culture and language on his life. And I asked him if he would be willing to present to us tonight um, to, so you could hear um, the, the inspiration of him about from learning language and culture. Unfortunately, he couldn't be with us tonight because he's on the airport. He's at the airport ready to fly home to Spain. But he did agree to, um, to talk to us via Zoom. But I'd like to introduce Alvaro Munoz Espledo. Alvaro? Yes, thank you so much. Can you hear me all right? We can. Amazing. Well, thank you so much, first of all, for inviting me tonight to this board meeting. I am I'm really honored to be here to share with all of you my speech. Whenever you're ready, please. Pardon? Whenever you're ready, go ahead. All right. So I will recite it as I, like the same way I did uh, when I was in the world language um, in Texas, Germany. Um, here it goes. <laughs> and at, at some point, I switched to Spanish because I also wanted to address our huge Hispanic community. So just, just so that you all know. So here it goes. Good evening. We want to start with, uh, first of all, I would like to start by congratulating our students for their enormous efforts and their excelling performance in world languages. It really is deserving of admiration for what you have achieved, because learning a language is not an easy task. It requires time, determination, and motivation. When I first embarked on my own journey of learning English, I was completely clueless as to what it would entail. As a matter of fact, I have always been a terrible student of English. I did not understand it, I couldn't speak it, and everything I learned in school was long vocabulary lists on how to conjugate the verb to be. But that completely changed when I had my first encounter with language in a real context. I was 14 years old when my parents signed me up a job program to stay with a host family and study in Ireland for three weeks. And I still remember myself starving in the airport of Madrid, saying goodbye to my parents and my sister. I was really scared. I was about to live in a foreign country with a family different from my own that spoke a language I barely spoke and that had different customs. And I did struggle at the beginning of my day. I felt impotent when I couldn't express myself the way I wanted, when I could understand what they were saying to me, or the accent had nothing to do with the way my teachers talked to me in school. And thus, misunderstandings were pretty common. Nevertheless, in all these misunderstandings, I saw an opportunity to learn. In all these misunderstandings, I saw helpful and willing people that were trying to make themselves understood. I saw the beauty of a country that despite cultural differences embraced me, the outsider, to make me feel at home. And most importantly, I saw the importance of suspending disbelief about other cultures and traditions and belief about my own ones to fully appreciate and understand them all. I actually had to distance myself from what I consider the norm in my country in terms of routines, schedules, food, and ways of thinking to adopt a spectator position and integrate into theirs. 
I believe that the way we see the world is very much shaped by our cultural glasses. And that is why we just sometimes need to change our glasses to change the way we perceive and interpret the world. And in doing so, learning a language would allow us to learn all the ways to think about things. So that was my first live changing experience with English language. And even though three weeks didn't make me proficient in English, it really was a turning point in my life. The following year, I went to Ireland again and stayed with the same host family. Then I went to the US for the first time and stayed in New York and Chicago. And by interacting with so many different people, experiencing their customs and traditions, getting to know their stories, and trying to understand their thinking and their perspectives in life, I carved out my personality and my language skills to make me finally make the decision of majoring in England at university. So I really couldn't be more grateful to my parents for what they did, because if it weren't for them pushing me to go to Ireland 11 years ago, I would have never been here. I would have never met such inspiring and amazing people as the teachers and students I have been sharing my time with. I would have never stayed with Senora Trujillo and David Joel with the Blackboards and the Martins, to whom I will be all eternally grateful. And I would have never traveled that much in the US and some Latin American countries to continue shaping my individual being. So thank you, mom and dad. And thank you to all the parents here. You're making a giant effort to encourage your children to both maintain your heritage languages and gain new languages. Gracias, de verdad. A todos los padres presentes por vuestro enorme esfuerzo, animando a vuestros hijos a mantener sus lenguas de herencia y adquirir nuevas lenguas. And I want to encourage you guys to get out of your comfort zone, to step forward and to make mistakes, because mistakes make us. They shape us and they allow us to thrive into a better version of ourselves. And I want to tell you, as an outsider, that you're all very lucky to be part of the community you belong to. Portuguese, Russian, Greek, German, French, Tuano, Georgian, Swedish, ASL, and Turkish are some of the languages spoken in the community. All the different cultures and languages spoken in the district really makes Southampton the ideal place to learn and benefit from diversity. Actually, with that 47% of Hispanic population, you guys have the perfect language scenario to benefit in a symbiotic relationship, where both your English and Spanish language skills flourish to become proficient. And I would have honestly loved to have had the opportunity to share my learning path with native speakers of the language I'm learning. So that said, keep on working as hard as you've been doing so far, because learning a language and the cultures that go with it is one of the most useful things we can do to build up our empathy, to be compassionate, and to connect people. Thank you so much. Alvaro, thank you for sharing that again with us this evening. We really appreciate you giving us this time and again letting the community hear the experience you had and hopefully it will um, impact our students the way the language learning has impacted you. So thank you again. Thank you so much. Good night. I would like, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, I would like to, to take advantage of this opportunity and just thank publicly everybody for embracing me in the beginning the very moment I arrived in Southampton. Because I feel like all the parents, teachers, and in general, all the staff, members of the of the school, for the intermediate and high school, really made things very easy for me. And I felt really valued and really great in the community. So thank you so much. I just wanted to, to, to say this publicly in here. Thank you so much. You're very welcome, and we appreciate you. Thank you. All right, our next presentation, I'll just wait till John reconnects. And actually, this is the third time you're hearing about this trip, and I'm so excited about it because um, um, Ms. Jeffries had a groundbreaking idea on behalf of her students, and she finally, and not she finally, but she actually made the trip happen, 
and I asked her if she would be willing to come back with her students and report back on how the trip went, um, um, the Black Girl Magic trip, and I think Ms. Jeffrey and her students will talk to us about the trip. I like she's standing and smiling. I made it. Yes. <laughs> Good evening. Um, I would like to thank the. My name is Natasha Jeffries, and I would like to thank um Dr. Dino and the board for having us back to uh, talk about the trip and our experience. Um, I also want to thank the board and the high school administration for support of the trip. Um, I had the privilege of taking twenty four amazing young people um with me on a college tour. Um, and we went as far south as uh, south as Atlanta. Um, and we all survived, nobody got lost, nobody got left, and we had no situations where I had to call Dr. Zahn. So to me, it was a, a success. <laughs> um, but we're here, um, this was the first, notice I said first, um, college tour that was hosted by Black Girl Magic, there's more to come. Um, and I have a few, Laura, you gonna join us? Come on. I have a few of the students with us that actually um, went on the trip, and I'm going to turn it over to them. And, and let me be let me be clear because I want to make sure that we're giving credit where credit is due. The idea actually came from members of Black Girl Magic. Um, they actually brought the idea to me, and um, I was so excited and said, "Let's do it." And so they put in all the work to uh, make this happen, and I just guided them along the way and supported them. So the credit really belongs to them. Well, thank you for letting us know. Um, my name is Sonia Morris. I'm in 11th grade, and I'm the vice president and one of the founding members of the Black Girl Magic Club. My name is Jerry Halsey. I am a member of the Black Girl Magic Club, and I'm a junior at Southampton High School. Uh, good evening. My name is Mara Joseph. I'm a junior at the Southampton High School, and part of the Black Magic Club. And we're here to present our experience from our past college tour over spring break. So the purpose of this tour was to um, make students of Southampton High School and students of various backgrounds um, feel like they've been given an opportunity to explore different colleges, different communities, um, and just really get the college experience that they might not have been able to get if we didn't host this tour. Um, students gained valuable insight through the exposure to various schools and their vast educational opportunities. As many minorities attending SHS are not exposed to these opportunities in preparation of attending colleges following high school graduation. We toured historically black colleges, HBCUs, and predominantly white institutions, PWIs, illustrating the spectrum of available colleges and universities students could potentially attend. We also visited museums, an aquarium, and the Naval Academy. So the historically black colleges that we did um, visit were Morehouse College, it's an all boys HBCU. So our boys went there. And then we visited Hampton University in Virginia, and we visited Howard in DC. The predominantly white institutions that we visited were Emory. So while the boys were at Morehouse, we visited Emory. And we visited Georgia Tech, Virginia Commonwealth University, Georgia State, and the US Naval Academy. Students had the opportunity to talk directly to college representatives and college students, gaining valuable educational insight about life on campus and other core and co concepts of Lake and college. This was very important as many people had not had this experience before. So for many, it was a first time look at what college life was and what college life could be for them in the future. And these are just some of the pictures that we took from the activities that we did. Um, very, every time we took a picture, Ms. Jeffrey say cheese. Um, so I thought that would just be cute to throw in there. Um, the top left picture is us in front of the Naval Academy. Um, then we're at Emory, we're in front of the American Indian Museum, with the boys in the hotel lobby. Um, that's Ms. Jeffrey's group that she took through the African American Museum. That's the mural in the entrance of the Civil Rights Museum in Atlanta. And then that's a group picture of us at the mall with uh, Dr. Ellis. And we just want to give a really special thank you to our sponsors. Um, this trip wouldn't have been able to 
happen without the sponsorship from you guys and just the support. And we want to thank you for taking the time to listen to our presentations and get feedback. And actually, some of the ideas that you guys gave us, we incorporated into our trip. So thank you. Um, so these are the list of the sponsors that helped us make this trip possible. The DCIP grant, the Shinnecock Tribal Council, Hampton Jitney, SYA, My Brother's Keeper, the Black Romantic Club, so I think Shinnecock Golfers Association, and um, Daryl Morton, the owner of Montauk Gas. And then on the bottom, thank you to our chaperones, Sean Smith, um, McCrina Robinson, and Lenny Matthews, my lovely mother. <laughs> um, so we just want to say thank you to everybody who put in the work, who put in the time, who listened to us, and who gave money. So thank you. Thank you. So I do just want to add, and I'm glad that Lenny is here, Macrina and Sean cannot be here, but um, I would not have made it if it was not for the amazing chaperones that I had with me. So Lenny, thank you, and to Macrina and Sean, thank you. Um, we really were a great team, and we actually, you know, good cop, bad cop, we did what we needed to do, but we had an amazing time. And really, thank you, because all of the people on um, this list actually made this trip possible, and to the parents for entrusting their children with us for um, seven days. Um, so I just want to say thank you. I do want to just shout out the Hampton Jitney, and I'm just going to say, because although we did pay for the Hampton Jitney, they did give us a great discount. But I think it's important to know that sometimes we go with the cheapest company, but we don't always go with the best company and the safest company for our children. And so earlier in the year, some of the students went on a trip to Cornell um, with a different bus company, and it was not a great experience. It was not a safe experience. So I think sometimes we need to consider what's best, not what's always the cheapest. Very good. May, may I ask you a question, um, Ms. Jeffries and the, and the students involved? So you implied that this was the first, that is the first of more trips to come? Yes. We intend on um, doing more trips in the future. London, myself, Jerry, the whole like kind of founding group, we are all graduating next year. Right. So we kind of wanted to do this just to start it for the future generation. Sure. And we hope that it continues even after we leave. So we definitely have a lot of planning to do to ensure that sure. that happens after we leave. And is your thought process to visit different schools the second round? Yeah. With possibly some of the same students, but different schools? Yeah. And then, okay, very good. Um, I just wanted to say that this was like a really nice experience. Um, I myself don't think I would have been able to visit all these colleges um, if this if it weren't for this trip. And I know a lot of the students who went on this trip, they all said, I want to go to college. Um, a lot of our boys really just, it, it woke them up and it was like, okay, like I need to, I need to get it together and I really, I want to go to college. Like I've experienced life outside of Southampton or the res, whatever it may be. And I would like to go to college, and now they know what they need to do, um, what they want to do, and where they want to go. Great. And I just want to remind the adults in the room that not only did the chaperones, but the students also gave up your whole spring break. I mean, this wasn't school time that you missed. You missed your own free time to do this. So it shows the, the importance you put on the trip. We and appreciate that. students had work to do over the break. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so it was, it was a lot. I did just want to add, just to answer your question, one of the things that we were thinking of um, for the fall is to actually tour some of the SUNY schools. So that's the next thing that we're planning for now. Fantastic. Thank you again for it. We really appreciate it. And our final presentation, and again, thank you, Ms. Tuggle, and thank you, uh, Mr. Little, for being so patient. Um, those of you who had time last week, on Thursday, almost a week ago, last Thursday, who had time to go to the high school and experience one of the first things, I hope the first of many, um, this title put together a career fair of over 72 vendors, the first time we've had it at Southampton Gymnasium, uh, in, the gymna in the gymnasium in our school, where we had a, a gymnasium full of tables with excited vendors and engaged students for two hours plus. And so um, this title, Mr. Little agreed to kind of debrief and recap the experience with the board tonight. So thank you for being here. Yeah, so I'll just say it was really exciting. We put the um, invitation out there and had an overwhelming response. We actually had to cut it off right before the fair because it was getting um, really big. 
But as you can see, we had um, you know over 70 businesses. You know, each of those businesses brought one to three people with them. So I thought that was really exciting that we had over 150 um, community members in our building and meeting our students and um, you know seeing what we have to offer as well. So uh, the jobs included all kinds of uh, jobs uh, between restaurants, kitchen work, beach attendants, lifeguards, golf courses, construction, retail, architecture. I mean, there were some really serious um, career path jobs that um, you know students could um, get internships as well as paid jobs. The you know obviously all the summer camps were looking Southampton Town. SYA, um, Hampton Jitney Fitness. So there was all, you know, a, a really wide variety. Um, so that was exciting. I just kept, you know, looking at kids saying, do you want to work inside, outside? Where do you want to be? Let's uh, go to a table. Um, so that was great. Uh, okay. Do I have the clicker? Thank you. <laughs> um, I just want to give some credit to everybody that helped. Um, Tanya, last my assistant, um, sent invitations to all the business, local business organizations. She kept track of the RSVPs, coordinated with the building staff. Um, Tom Little, who's standing here with me, uh, or is going to be standing, was um, literally hit the pavement and went door to door in town on his lunch hour to recruit businesses to come. So that was exciting. And um, and then of course our you know administration, our custodial staff, security, and everybody all ensured that this went smoothly. And Really, uh, another big piece of this was the teachers and the counselors pushed into the classrooms and really emphasized that our students need to make a good impression um, when they walk in that door. So that was really uh, fun to see. I mean, kids were, uh, students were walking into the gym and I was standing at the door and they'd say, good afternoon. I'm like, great practice. Keep it in there and, you know, go, go say that to everybody. So they were um, really, the kids were great, and uh, I know the businesses um, appreciated that, so we're going to talk about that in a minute. Um, and then I'm just going to have Tom explain to you uh, this, his technology um, skills that he had. Thanks for having me out. So proud to be part of the greatest counseling team on East End. Um, thank you so much. But uh, So basically, as far as collecting data, we did traditional paper applications. We also want to try QR codes out. So many of our kids are kind of phone-driven. And so um, kids walked around. We had these QR codes at every vendor's table. Kids could walk up. The top one basically showed a list of all the different jobs available. Um, so kids could see who the employers were, what the positions were, how much each job paid. Uh, after that, the second QR code showed a, um, a survey, basically a Google survey. And then there was drop downs for different jobs where you could select the job that you want. The whole thing from beginning to end could be done just two minutes on your phone. Uh, and then basically what we did from there was that data got aggregated that night and then emailed to each of the vendors. So then, you know, what they could do was have interviews later on in the week. Actually, really interestingly, uh, we got this really nice letter earlier today from, who is this from? Service Matters Hamptons. Good morning, Martha, Tanya, and Tom, or excuse me, team. I just wanted to reach out and thank you all for a great experience at the job fair you held at the high school last week. We had the opportunity to meet many great candidates and enjoy speaking to all the students and teachers and staff that came by our table. We've already reached out to the interested students and I've been set for this week. With our experience in events, I know there's no small feat to host a job fair. It's very well organized and well attended. We thank you for the opportunity to attend and we look forward to participating in future events. Kind regards, Caitlin Stukas, Service Matters Hamptons. So from beginning to end, it was really nice and thank you for the opportunity. So we thank you for all the work you put into this. Um, any feedback from the students? Have you heard back from students? I um, I have not had a chance because I've been sitting in interviews. But I, mean, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I think I know that students are um, getting calls. And we are going to be emphasizing to students that when those employers call, you need to um, show up when they're asking you to show up and, uh, and, and answer that text message um, when you get it. Because that is important. So students, you know, may 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 ignore the text, and, and we need to make sure that they do do their follow up as well. Um, what a great picture too. Yeah, and so that was Dr. Dino, I did uh, get a chance to hear feedback from many of our students, and even from students who went into the job fair um, thinking that they were not going to work or or anything else, and came out with jobs. So it was uh, quite an amazing event, and, and Martin and the counseling team, Tom, did just a phenomenal job. 
The student feedback was phenomenal. The business feedback that we received that day was fantastic. So kudos on it. Uh, just an amazing. And, and what I think was great too is that they, I know they'll come back. The businesses were really happy. They really loved our students. And that is, you know, that's important. And I was um, asking their feedback as they were um, leaving and packing up. And they all kept saying this was worth it. And we will be back again. And they really loved it. And I love to hear that they loved our students. So that was great. Yeah. And and most that of was the, the shout out also. We heard um, from the vendors just on how amazing our students were. Mm -hmm. And that was something that I want to stress because we heard that a number of times um, from many of the job um, and the businesses that came um, just really discussing how um, engaged our students were, how well behaved they were, how um, just the, the whole atmosphere was really, really good. So it's a great experience. Yeah, and it's really a testament to our community. Not all students are comfortable talking to adults and doing that. And I think that they feel comfortable, obviously, in our school community. So that was great. And, you know, come on, that's fine. Uh, the most important um, that's right. person yeah. that got a job was, uh, yeah. Walking around. <laughs> so it was um, walking around. And one of the businesses that were there I saw was um, Tiki Joe's. And she was asking where, uh, which is they manage uh, many of the beaches, and asking, I was explaining that I was the principal but not living um, in the area. So she asked where I was living. I said, Santa Maria. She's like, do you have a son? Uh, <laughs> and I said, by chance I do. Do they need a job? I said, yes, they do. So not this form right now, and he is hired at TP Jones. <laughs> Great news. So thank you. Um, I, I just want to emphasize, I was I was there um, and, and watched this whole thing come together after months and months of working on it. Um, so impressed. And I heard the same thing from many of the vendors. Many, many of the businesses were highly impressed, more so than what they were saying was the preparation for hiring for the season. They were more impressed with our students than they have been in the past few weeks with adults coming um, for jobs or not showing up for, you know, for interviews. Um, and the diversity of opportunities, I think, was the most valuable part of it. Um, and you really spanned such a, a great uh, opportunities for, for kids who have experience, who don't have experience, and the variety of that, I think, was invaluable. Um, and I, I just think you did a great job. I love the engagement. They were so engaged, and like you said, even kids who thought or would say to me, I already have a job, you know? traded up like I, I felt like they <laughs> traded up because they would come to me and say, well we may go for this interview we may look into this um and a lot of kids who haven't had jobs in the in the past were were much more apt to approach a table with one person there who was you know welcoming to give them the opportunity to fill out the forms right there and just talk about the the opportunities that they have rather than going walking into a store it, it can be very intimidated for teenagers so that was another valuable part. So overall, a huge success. It was so nice to see the engagement on both ends, on both sides, and and hopefully a lot of our students will get great opportunities. I hope so too. And thank you to the board members who came. That was great. Um, all the all help was needed. Yeah. <laughs> well, again, Martha, you and Tom, Tanya, and your whole counseling team. Thank you for all the work you put into this because um, I think we're not going to know the benefits until after the summer right. we see everyone who's right. worked and the experience that they've had. Right. So again, thank yeah. you so much. Okay, good. Thanks. Yes, okay, we are on to public comments. Public comments will be heard on agenda items only at this time. The Board of Education encourages public participation on school related matters at board meetings. Any group or organization wishing to address the board must identify a single spokesperson. Presentations should be as brief as possible. No speaker will be permitted to speak for longer than three minutes. The board will not permit in public session discussion involving individual district personnel or students, and all speakers are to conduct themselves in a civil manner. I've seen language, libelous statements, threats of violence, statements advocating racial, religious, or other forms of prejudice will not be tolerated. Persons making presentations at the board meeting will address remarks to the president and may direct questions or comments to board members or other district officials only upon approval of the president. Anybody else come up? Hi, my name is Nicole. Um, I have three kids in intermediate and one kid in elementary. 
Um, I'm here tonight just to, I don't know if this is a proper place to do it, um, just a few little frustrations I've recently had. Um, my son came back from his eighth grade trip yesterday, um, which is supposed to be, you know, they used to have these Frost Valley trips and stay overnight. And there was, there was talk of a Quinnipet day, day trip that never happened and they decided to go on a Mets trip instead. And we had to pay $75 per kid plus food. You know, I expected when I came to pick him up last night that he would be getting off something better than a school bus. Um, I'm just, I, I just feel like they deserve so much more than a day trip to a Mets game. Um, with that being said, I would also like to address my sixth grader not going on any field trips whatsoever this year and none being planned. Um, I'm representing a whole bunch of parents I've been talking to recently and we feel as though this is unacceptable. There's not even a beach trip planned for the end of the year. Um, so I don't know what can be done about that, who I need to speak to. I just don't think it's fair. Um, my last thing I want to talk about is uh, the cafeteria food. <laughs> if there's anything I can possibly do, uh, make surveys to be handed out to the kids, to be returned, um, just seems like the quality of the food is pretty harsh. Uh, not very nutritional and tastes gross. <laughs> um, so I don't know if that's even possible of me to make you know, questionnaires to be handed out to the kids to see how they, because I know how my kids feel about it. Um, and it's really difficult to figure out what to make them every day for lunch. Um, I just wish they could eat at school, but they hate it. So I know that's very minute, but um, that's my speech. So thank you. Nicole, can you, yeah. for the record, can you just give us your last name? Oh, sorry, Colum, C-O-L-L-U-M. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you. Oh, thank you. I know it's getting late, so I have three reports. I'll try to keep them brief. The first one is a, a report that I typically do every month um, around the first of the month is give you an enrollment update. Um, and I will tell you that, um, as John's pulling that up, um, we have our enrollment for the month of May, actually, for May 1st, is 1355, which is our highest month for enrollment, um, the highest snapshot that we've had for the first of any month this school year. So we are at 1355. We've picked up a student, um, one student in fourth grade, two additional students in fifth grade, one student in sixth grade, and two additional students in seventh grade. I will tell you, um, you know, as um, Ms. Tuttle said, we've been interviewing the past couple of days in the office right adjacent to the registrar's office, and there have been people coming in the registration office, um, both for next year as well as the remaining part of this year, registering daily. He has appointments. A registrar has appointments scheduled almost every hour. So they're I'm not sure what's happening in the community, but there are people moving in um, and signing up kids to finish the school year out here more than typical. Next thing I wanted to talk about is, um, John, I'm sorry, to, is a letter to um, St. John's, I'm sorry, St. Joseph's University, New York. It goes by SJNY now. And we did enter a partnership with St. Joseph's. Um, it was a non-financial commitment, but we um, entered an agreement with St. Joseph's um, on a grant that they apply for with the state where we will become a school district partnering with the university to offer five required virtual synchronous courses um, over a 12-month period that would allow, that would enable someone to get certified in, with an E&L extension. Um, a reduced number of, a reduced cost rate um, tuition would be $1,450 per course. So for $7,200, a person could complete the five courses and have that E&L certification on added to a certificate and get it done. It starts in September, and it would be done by the end of June. So it's a nice opportunity for those who are interested. Um, once we hear back from the state that they approved our application, we'll say more. And I'm going to talk to the district about incentivizing some teachers that would make it even more mark, more, um, more desirous for people to get the certification. But it really would help us 
serve our students as we talked about our changing population to have as many teachers as possible to have on the ENL extension added to their certificates. So it's a nice opportunity with no financial commitment to the district and may allow our teachers to um, you know, advance on the salary schedule with lower cost than typical college courses and in an easy format that they could complete while they're teaching. So it's a nice opportunity um, if the state gets approved. And the, other, the third thing I wanted to talk about is something um, Mrs. Pearson and I looked throughout the records um, and we've been talking about adopting organizational charts. And when we looked at the past, the way it's been done in the past is we do have a policy that talks about the organization of the district and we've had organizational charts that have been presented in superintendent's reports, but the charts themselves have never been you know, a motion and never been officially approved by the district. So I just wanted a chance to present the charts to the board tonight so you can officially, um, I know we've discussed it, but so you can officially um, have the charts as part of our board record that these are the charts that will guide us through the remainder of this year. We'll update as we go through with next year with any changes, but these will become our official charts that we'll be using um, from this point forward for the organizational charts. And we do have um, I'm not going to go through them all, but there's several different layers. There's level one, there's level two, so there's level three that talk about the different areas of detail and who's responsible for which areas of service. We will add them to our website for all employees to see, <laughs> but for now, as I said, I just wanted to publicly present them to the board um, so that you can see. Are there any questions on any of the three topics I've covered from the board members? Thank you so much. I just want to make one note for this communication flow to the major areas. The, sh the sheet where it, um, sure. where it shows the beam facilities committee. Mm -hmm. Can we just make a notation that um, that it goes through any any correspondence goes through the clerk's office? Yes, I did. Um, we talked about that this afternoon. I did make the note just because the person I haven't yeah, put yeah, together to make this change. Absolutely. That we know the committee doesn't individually get those. Okay. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Okay, on to the administrator's reports. Oh, Mr. Monroe, I think you're all set, right? Do you have anything else you want to add? Uh, one quick item. Um, the audit and finance committee met last Tuesday, so...